Hi there, Stephendale family. This is Stephen Young, and I am here in our fellowship hall on Wednesday. We normally meet here in the fellowship hall building on Wednesdays for a number of ministries, not the least of which is our prayer meeting, a weekly prayer meeting. And we usually begin those with a reading from scripture that uh, informs, instructs, or gives examples for our praying. The disciples asked Jesus to teach us to pray, and he did. But one of the things we do is we learn to pray by instruction and by example. The scripture gives us many of those examples. And so we are not meeting today because of the pending weather, a lot of wind outside, rain is coming, thunderstorms are coming. Uh, but I did want to go ahead and take this time to challenge you who will see this video in your prayer life especially in your prayer life for your church. How do you pray for your church? Well, in our Sunday school lesson this past Sunday, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we see a great example. Paul himself writes out or wrote out a prayer for the church at Thessalonica. And so this is a good example of how Paul prayed for a church. And what I'd like us to do is read that and then to extrapolate uh, maybe six ideas or six areas in which we can pray for our church. Uh, three are directly stated and three are more or less implied, but I think we'll see them all here in this scripture. So let's read. Uh, this, by the way, came from our Sunday school lesson, and I hope the camera is not mirrored. It may be. Uh, the Explore the Bible um, Sunday school guide is what the one we use here at Stephendale. And so our lesson here uh, includes the verses 11 through 13, which is Paul's prayer for the church in Thessalonica, or one of the many that are in that book. Allow me to read that for you. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another and for everyone, just as we do for you. May he make your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. Now, uh, that is just wonderful prayer there. I'm going to pick out six, six ideas that will inform our praying as well. First of all, and this is aside from those points. Notice our God and Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, how they're put together in that passage. Uh, quite often in Scripture, you never see the word Trinity in Scripture, but you quite often see a coupling of God the Father and God the Son, or God the Son and God the Spirit, or God the Spirit and God the Father, and uh, equated as one. So here you see distinct and yet also the um, a unity. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ or our Lord direct our way to you. So it's praying, um, speaking of God the Father is distinct, Jesus as distinct, the Son, God the Son, Lord Jesus, and then also them together in thought. So that's interesting. Just another point to show the deity, the fullness of the deity in Christ. Now, the first thing that Paul prays for, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And just in the previous verse, Paul talked about the desire to see them face to face, that he prayed for it uh, night and day. Um, if we were to just take Paul's praying here and say, now what's an application for us? I would say that we need to be praying for the church to gather face to face. And quite often, uh, when we think about church Sunday mornings or whatever else, especially believers uh, who have been a little bit wayward in their attendance of church or something like that, or uh, just haven't been attending as much since COVID or since the flood here in Baton Rouge or something else, um, we think of it in terms of duty and responsibility we say oh i i you know i really need to get up and go to church that's my that's my responsibility 
and uh, we create for ourselves a discipline of going to church, which is a great and laudable discipline. I would that every Christian would get up and go to church on Sundays. Um, do we pray for the church to gather and to gather face to face? Paul prayed that God would direct our way to you. Now, I would like to encourage you to begin to pray for Stephendale Baptist Church and other churches too, that God would gather his people face to face, that we would pray that God would gather his people. That's a whole lot different than saying to yourself, I need to go to church, or I wish more people would come to church, or uh, God, make the circumstances favorable so that going to church is convenient or easy or safe. But here Paul simply prayed that God would direct them together. And so as we pray for our churches, as you pray for Stephendale, pray that God would gather his church. Ask God to gather his people, gather his church face to face. If you would pray that, I believe God listens and answers and I think that's the prayer our church needs today because there are so many believers that are not going to church these days. They are connecting, you know, watching videos, what have you. Uh, some churches have done a much better job of forming small groups where people are still getting in community. But by and large, many, many believers are not attending a fellowship. They are not in fellowship. God, gather your church. That's what we need to be praying. God, gather your church. Gather believers face to face. Direct their way to us. Direct our way to them. The second thing he prays for, verse 12, and may the Lord cause you to increase. Paul prayed for the church in Thessalonica to grow. We must pray for churches to grow. Now, not every church that grows and not all church growth is kingdom growth, but kingdom growth is always church growth. The church that grows does not necessarily grow the kingdom, but the church that grows the kingdom grows. But really, uh, we need to be praying for our churches to grow. There are so many churches, including Stephendale, uh, where the attendance is much lower than what you would expect or want. Uh, projected attendance versus the reality of attendance pre-COVID and post-COVID post is just so different. So uh, churches that should be running 100, 150 are running 25 and 50. And uh, some have just uh, gone from 1,000 down to 200. And so uh, church attendance is low, but also there are a number of non-believers out there, people who almost know the gospel but don't. And so this prayer that the church would grow is not prayer that the believers who were scattered would gather again, but it's the prayer that the lost would be reached with the gospel, that there would be evangelistic growth in the church. Are you praying for your church to grow? And not in the sense of selfish growth, like I just hope that our church has more people and more money, but to grow in the sense of reaching the lost for Jesus, reaching lost children for Jesus, rearing children up in the Lord so that they would know Jesus, and then also reaching the lost who are outside of the congregation, that the church would grow by evangelistic growth. We must pray for that. That's number two. And overflow with love for one another. So Paul prayed for the church in Thessalonica to have love one for another, that the church members would love one another. Now, the church in Thessalonica, do you remember the story of the church in Thessalonica? It said that there were some Jews who believed, many Greeks who believed, and some prominent women, not a few prominent women. So there were different groups or classes, uh, different cultures, different ethnicities, and different uh, backgrounds, familial backgrounds of people in the church in Thessalonica. This was not any group that should have a necessary unity because of creed or culture, um, or politics, or language, what have you, or class, but just because of Jesus Christ. So that is, um, this church needed 
to, to know what it is to love one another. And so the way that a church displays its love one for another is through its unity. And there's a hymn that says we are one in the bond of love. You may remember that. A church's love one for another is manifest in its unity, in its unity. And so we are praying, if we are praying like Paul for our church, just as he prayed for Thessalonica, for the church in Thessalonica, to have love within the church for believer for believer, brother for brother, sister for sister, that there would be love, love one another in a unity, a peculiar unity that springs forth from that. So that's number three. Number one, we pray for God to gather his church. Number two, face to face. Number two, we pray that God would grow his church. Number three, we pray that God would increase the love in his church in such a way that it springs forth, manifests itself in unity, much like Jesus' prayer in John 17. I pray, Father, that they may be one, just as you and I are one, because when they are one, then the world will know that you sent me. All right. With love for one another and for everyone, just as we do for you. So, not just the love of believer towards believer within the church manifesting in unity, but also in... Um, in love for the lost, love for those outside the church. And a church should be known for its love, and they will know that we are his disciples by our love. And so uh, the church has to have a love for the lost world. Not just a desire to see the lost saved, but a genuine love for lost people. And we saw that quite clearly in the ministry of Jesus. In fact, people were scandalized by the amount of love Jesus showed towards the lost and that he really cared for people. That's number four. God, increase the love of Stephendale Baptist Church for the lost. The next one, verse 13. May he make your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father. May he make your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father. That is, Paul prayed for the holiness of the church in Thessalonica. That they wouldn't just be a, a group of people who have decided to follow Jesus, that they've called upon him to be saved. Not that they would just be a group that has some unity and love one for another and a group that's growing, but a group that is becoming holy as he is holy. A group that is becoming a people who reflect the character and heart of God the Father and the character and the heart of Jesus. That they would be blameless in holiness before our God. So we need to be praying in our application. God, make our church to be holy. Help each one of us, each one of our members to daily repent, upon, repent from sin and mortify the flesh and, and to daily take upon the holiness of Jesus. Cast out our sins and, and let us live before you. So pray for the holiness of God's church. That's number five. So let's just review there, and then I'll bring the last one. We pray for God to gather his church face to face, that people who are out of fellowship and people who are not gathered would gather face to face again with believers. Two, that God would grow his church, that the church of Jesus would grow through evangelism. Three, that the church would have love one for another, just as uh, Jesus prayed in John 17, that we would have a unity, a peculiar unity, that's the manifestation of love one for another. Four, that the church would love the lost, love those outside of the church, love them the way Jesus did. Number five, that uh, the church would be holy, that they would, the church would, would strive towards holiness. There would not be wickedness in the church. There would be transformation of character within the church. And then number six, the last one, is an implied one. 
May he make your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. And so this one's implied. But it says, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Now, the gospel is not just believe on the Lord Jesus and your sins will be forgiven and you'll be saved and you'll go to heaven when you die. The gospel is that Jesus died and rose again, that he ascended to heaven and that he's coming again. And so there is going to be an end to this story and a beginning to the rest of eternity, that Jesus will return. He's coming as he came as the Savior. He's coming as the judge. Uh, and he will uh, make a new heaven and new earth. And so um, we know that one day Jesus will return. And this means that our time, these last days that we live in, are limited. Uh, we don't know when Jesus will return. No one knows that day or hour, the scripture says. Plenty of clues out there tell us that the return of Jesus could be nigh. But Jesus told many parables saying that we need to be working faithfully until his return. And that's really where the implied prayer is. Since Jesus is to return, since we do not know when his return will be, and since he is definitely coming, because we have a limited time to do the work of the church, that we would be diligent. And so the implied, uh, the implied end, the sixth thing that we would pray for, is that the church would be diligent about doing the work of the harvest, the work of the church. And so would you do that? Would you pray for Stephendale Baptist Church and any other church you know that you have on your heart that God would gather his people together face to face, that the church would grow evangelistically, that the church would have love one for another and manifest itself in a unity, a peculiar unity in the world. That the church would love, have a genuine love for the lost, that the church would grow in holiness and be blameless before the Lord and that the church would be diligent. That is a way that you can pray for Stephen Dale Baptist Church. And if you want to follow the example of Paul, go back to verse 12, I'm sorry, verse 10, where he says, and I pray this night and day. God bless you, and thank you for listening to me for these uh, 17 or 18 minutes. I'm sorry that we couldn't gather together for a prayer meeting, but I ask that you would pray for your church today. God bless you. Bye-bye.